Right to be read podcast, episode number one hundred twenty-six. Interview with AC Fuller. You are listening to the Right to Be Read podcast, and this is your host, Ani Alexander. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Right to Be Read podcast, the podcast that inspires and encourages writers. It's me, Ani Alexander, and as always, I would like to thank you for listening to the show. I truly appreciate your time, and I hope that you're getting the inspiration, the encouragement, and the knowledge that we're trying to provide here. So today we're having another interview. Uh, today I will be talking to AC Fuller. And A.C. Fuller is a fiction author. He also leads writing workshops for adults and hosts the Writer 2.0 podcast, which I highly recommend to listen. Okay, well, I guess we should just hop over and start the interview and I hope you like it. Hello, A.C. Welcome to the Write to be Read podcast. I'm really happy to have you over. Thanks so much for having me. It's a thrill to be on with you. Yeah, well, it's it's really nice. I was very happy to be on your podcast, and you know, it's really nice to have you over on mine now. <laughs> yes, I'm glad we're I'm glad we're doing it. Oh yeah, for those of you who don't know, uh, AC is the host and creator of Writer 2.0 podcast, and it's a really great podcast for writers. So if you enjoy mine, you should check out his as well. Okay, so let's talk about, I mean, this is the rare case, one of the rare cases when I'm having a fiction author over because usually nonfiction authors are more frequent guests on my show than fiction ones. Right. So I'm really happy that this time we're covering fiction too because I myself write fiction, so it's really nice. So um, let's just, you know, I know that you haven't been writing all the time and you've done various different things before. So let's just start with your personal story, personal journey of how did you end up writing fiction books? Yeah, so I was when I got out of college, I started writing fiction. That was about thirteen years ago. But uh, I was also working. I was a chef at the time, and I was wasn't very serious about it. I would start something and then stop it, and never really do the work of editing it till the point when I thought it was publishable. So I never was that serious, but I was always scribbling things down, writing things. I wrote half of a novel and then abandoned it because I lost interest, things like that. So I was a chef at the time, and then I decided to work in journalism. So I decided to do what a lot of aspiring fiction writers do, which is to get into journalism, just to practice writing and get out into the world. So I did journalism. Uh, Then I went to graduate school for journalism, for a couple of years, I was also editing uh, mostly nonfiction, kind of in a freelance way at the time in New York City. And uh, I was also still a chef. I did catering part time to kind of to pay my way and uh, pay the bills for my family. And after graduate school, I actually got hired to teach at, at NYU, New York University, where I taught journalism, uh, writing and media history. Uh, and I did that for a few years. And all the while, I knew I would get back to my own writing at some point. But I think having a lot of different experiences was really good for me. Uh, At least in my in my early twenties, I don't you know like most people, I hadn't done very much or experienced very much, and so I think my writing was more self referential and about me in a way that you know needed to be worked on a little bit. So then uh, I worked at a conference center. I was a chef there, and then I helped run this conference center uh, when I left NYU in 2010, I think it was. No, 2008, I left NYU and worked at this conference center for a few years. And uh, then my wife and I just decided to move to the West Coast. We live in near Seattle now, and we decided I would take some time off and she would work. She's a nurse, so I could get more serious about my writing. So I'd been writing the whole time and doing some journalism and scribbling. And then I got serious about writing novels, uh, a few years ago. And, and my first book just came out a couple months, a couple months ago, the anonymous source. Wow. Congratulations. So it was the first one. It's the first book. Yeah. It's my first published book. I wrote 
I wrote chunks of other books that and sh- that I abandoned because I lost interest in them and uh-huh. published some short stories at various places. But it's my first novel that's out in the world. Okay, I see. Well, let's in this case, uh, let me ask you about journalism. I'm, I always wonder, those who studied and practiced journalism at some point, uh, how much does it help or maybe just the opposite just gets on the way of creative writing? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, and I think it is both of those things. I think it helps in that when you're doing journalism, you have to get used to writing a lot uh, very quickly. Uh, so you learn to write, you know, a thousand words in an hour, uh, because you're on deadline and you have to do that. And you learn to write pretty well, very quickly. And so I think that's a positive. You just learn that you can, even when you're in a bad mood, you can still write, Mm -hmm. uh, even, even when you don't feel like it, you can still write. Um, so I think that's very good. I think it's good that depending on what you're doing, you get out into the world, you meet interesting people, you get to interview people, It's a good excuse to cold call people and ask them about their job or about their life or about their business or about Mm -hmm. their area of expertise. You get exposed to all sorts of very interesting people and interesting things. So I think that's great. Uh, The downside, I would say, one is you're putting a lot of your energy into writing stuff that you might not be that interested in. You're not putting your energy into writing your own fiction. You're putting your energy into, you know, writing a story about a town hall meeting or about a sporting event or whatever you happen to be working on. So that's a downside. And I would say for me, the biggest downside was that it's the writing style is a little bit different. You know, it's um, maybe a little bit more dry in journalism, a little less literary, a little less poetic. Uh, which I think can be a good thing. I like fiction that is straight to the point and is uh, as spare as possible with words. But at the same time, I think my first efforts were a little bit too dry, a little bit too spare, a little too journalistic. So I think that's a possible downside. Okay, I see. So basically, um, you get this habit of writing Always, no matter whether you feel like writing or not. But uh, at the same time, like journalistic style may get on the way, right? It can get in the way. And, you know, a lot of who are usually considered many of the greatest American writers were journalists and have a pretty spare journalistic style. Like Hemingway is the most famous example of that. Um, But it can get too dry sometimes if you're doing that day in, day out and You'd mm-hmm. call Hemingway, Hemingway wrote sparely, wrote kind of in a journalistic spare style, but not, you wouldn't definitely wouldn't call it dry or, you know, soulless, which journalism can sometimes feel oh, yeah. like. Oh, yeah. So I, I would say that the, the other thing is you also get used to editing and get used to criticism. Uh, and I don't mean criticism like, you know, being super negative, but just you get used to the fact that you're going to write something, you're going to write it fast, and then people are going to edit it, and they're going to try to make it better, and everyone is just going to try to make it better, and then it's going to get published. Uh So that you get used to that, and as writing fiction, you really have to get used to the fact that you need other eyes on your work. You know, you need editors, you need beta readers, you need all of that. So the sooner you can get used to that, uh, the sooner I think uh, you can write, start writing really good fiction. So that, that yeah. was very useful to get used to that feedback, I think. Okay, I see. Well, you were, when you were writing fiction, did you already have any plan in place in terms of you know, what you will be doing with that book once it's written? No. When I wrote the first draft of The Anonymous Source, I didn't really know that much about the publishing business. I knew some, you know, probably more than the average person on the street, but I wasn't really enmeshed in it like I am now. So I just thought I would write write the first draft and see, can I actually get this book done? You know, can I finish this book? Once I did and I started rewriting and rewriting, then I, I really decided I wanted it to be published somehow. Uh, after It was after about, you know, the second or third draft. I thought, okay, this is good enough that I'm going to take it as far as I can and edit it to the point where I really feel like it's on par with the the books in the genre. And so, which the first draft wasn't, you know, the first draft was just a first draft. But so 
once I decided that, I, I started looking into literary conferences, started meeting agents, started talking, you know, studying the publishing world, studying self-publishing, traditional publishing, and started submitting to literary agents. And I decided to really just to go through the whole process. And, and I was ended up getting very close with a few traditional literary agents in New York City, and they ended up passing on the book. And in the meantime, I met uh, my publisher, which is called Book Trope, which is based in Seattle. It's a new, uh, fairly small publisher here. And I met them. And after a while, I ended up submitting to them and they accepted the book. And that started about a six-month process that I went through with them of editing the book again, cover design, proofreading, and all that. Okay. So you went to uh, traditionally published Ruth? Well, it's it's book trope is called a hybrid publisher, and they're oh, yeah. they're actually oh. they're actually the only one that does the particular model they do. It's a it's a kind of confusing model. So they're they're not like a New York traditional publisher, but they're not self publishing either, and they're not a, one of the what we call like a vanity press where you pay a lot of money to get your book published. So uh, what they do is you submit your book to them. If they accept it, uh, you. You go through the same process you would go through in a traditional publisher where you have an editor, a cover designer, a layout person, uh, a proofreader, and a marketing person or a marketing team for your book, except that you don't pay them anything, but they don't pay you anything either. They don't pay you in advance like a traditional big publisher would. Uh-huh. If you, uh-huh. with Simon, you know, if my book had sold to Simon & Schuster, they would have given me an advance of you know $5,000 or $50,000 or whatever it was. So the way it works at Book Trope is everyone gets a percentage of the revenue. So oh, okay. yeah. uh, the, the company keeps – a, a third, roughly, this is all negotiable, but roughly a third. Uh, the I keep roughly a third, and then my team, my marketing people, my cover designer, my editor, my proofreader, they keep roughly a third split between them of the profit of every book sold. So if the book doesn't sell, nobody makes any money. If the book sells a lot, everybody makes a lot of money. And okay. then there's every everything in between. So you it's like a it's like halfway in between self-publishing and then old school traditional publishing. And for me so far, it's been an excellent model. It's worked really well for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's it's quite fair. And I guess, you know, the pressure is on the marketing team <laughs> to make sure. It's... Right. That's where yeah. the that's where a lot of it hinges, you know, as well as I do trying to get your own books out there. That's that's the hardest part. Well, actually, I think writing a really phenomenal book is maybe the hardest part. But after that, assuming you've got a very good book that's been well edited and w- well presented. Uh, yeah. And and the author still has to do a lot of the marketing. It's it's not like I say, OK, the book is done. You know, go market it now. Uh, I no. do. Mo- I really do most of the work on that. They help. They give ideas. They they definitely do a lot. My marketing team. But, you know, I'm I'm working on it every single day. And that's how it should be, really. You yeah. know, that's the world we live in now where authors have to do that, whether you're traditionally published, self-published or everything in between. Authors just need to do that. And, and so I and I already go out and give talks in the community and things like that. And I'm online. So I handle a lot of it. But it's good to have support also. It's good to yeah. have smart people who are helping out, helping me think through things submitting, you know, submitting me to bookstores, things like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So um, how did you come up with the idea for your book? How did you just, you know, how did it come to you? And uh, how did it develop to become a whole book? So when I was writing maybe 10 years ago, I, I was writing another book that I ended up abandoning. And one of the keys in the story was a college student was wandering late at night, drunk, across the college campus, and he witnessed a guy dying in the park. And he didn't do anything. He didn't go try to help him. He didn't go try to hurt him. He just sort of watched. And throughout the book, we kind of found out why that was, what was going on, how the guy died. That was something I was working on about 10 years ago. So then when I got serious about writing, you know, three, four years ago, I had that kind of kernel of that scene. And I knew I wanted to write a book that was a thriller slash mystery with a journalist at the center. I knew I wanted to set it in New York City. 
because uh, that's where I'd lived for a while. And I knew I wanted it to happen in the early 2000s because uh, I was fairly – that's why I lived there then and I was pretty enmeshed in the media world at that time. And also it was right after 9-11. And so that was a big time in U.S. history, especially in New York City. And of all the different changes that were happening in media then, that was before Facebook. That was right when Google was taking off. That was before the iPhone. It was before, at the time, only about half of people had internet access in their homes. So I wanted to write a story about the media and a, with a journalist at the center that was both designed to be kind of a page-turning thriller mystery and also uh, got to some deeper stuff about the changes that have happened in media and that's the starting point uh, that I – as I see it, around 2002 or so when journalism and the media started changing completely. And now you know, we've all seen that change happen you know, with, with social media especially. Back in 2002, there really wasn't social media in any way like we think about it now. Oh, yeah. so, I wanted to set, so I wanted to set the story there. But I also wanted it to be a page turner with you know, a hero and uh, a very strong uh, – uh, female, I, some people think of her as a sidekick. I really think of her as like a secondary main character because she's she's a key character. And some murders and, you know, uh, a love affair and all sorts of classic book stuff, but set against this, this media New York City backdrop. Okay, I see. So how are you usually writing? Are you from those who outline a lot and have everything planned and only after that sit down and actually write it up or you kind of you uh, let characters uh, lead you or you are willing to be a bit flexible and see you know how it goes a little bit of both i have the whole the, the book i knew was going to be the first in a trilogy and i'm working on the second now and so i have a a pretty good idea of the overarching story structure of how the main the main characters and the story will develop over the course of three books. But that's just big picture stuff. Within each book, what I do is I will look at major turning points, maybe six to ten major turning points in the book that I know are going to happen. Um, and then I will just go for it. So I don't outline in a great detail – but I will outline enough to know that, well, around halfway through the book, this is going to happen, I think. And sometimes that changes, actually. But that's I'm kind of aiming at big story points that I know need to happen in the character development or in the, the plot or in the relationship between two characters sometimes. So I'll aim at big things. And then if the characters end up doing something else, then that's OK, too. But I, I'm very big into into classic story structure and the kinds of story structure that is compelling and has been compelling for thousands of years. So I try to work within a kind of rough story structure of what is going to happen with my characters emotionally, psychologically, uh, etc. Okay. So how do you deal with criticism when you're getting a feedback for your writing? Especially I know that you like the first books are really kind of special. <laughs> and you know, they're a bit different because they're the first ones and you, you, you know, I don't know, at least I'm pretty emotionally connected to that book. It's, it's, a, it's, a different one for me because it's the first. So uh, when you're getting feedback and, you know, when uh, bet beta readers are reading it and coming back with some things uh, they would like to change or they recommend to, to do something with a text or a plot or something like that, how, what's your reaction? I mean, I we touched it a little bit, you saying that, you know, journalists are getting used to their texts turning around and changing a bit by editors and stuff like that. But uh, what about your creative writing? Yeah, I would definitely say it's a little harder with the creative <laughs> writing because there's, you know, a little more personal stuff on the page. Um, with journalism, you know, it's mostly about is this sentence as good as it can be or can we make it shorter or more efficient? And that's the kind of stuff where you just get used to that and it doesn't really hurt. But when it's deeper stuff about characters or this is ridiculous because this person would never do this or 
I'm I'm bored halfway through the book, you know, things like that. You know, I I try to first of all don't believe everyone's criticism or their feedback. The book isn't going to work for everyone. You know, most yeah. books most books don't work for everyone. You know, if you go look at Harry Potter or uh, you know, The Great Gatsby or Hemingway or The Bible, they've all got one star reviews on Amazon. Oh yeah. Uh, the books aren't going to work for everyone. So that's one thing I, for me I find useful is don't trust every beta reader or every editor you have or you don't change the book just because they don't like something. If it's you know it's their opinion, it's true for them but it doesn't mean you need to change it. So what I tried to do is get as many – I treat it kind of like a focus group. I get as – I got as many people as I could, mm-hmm. uh, di- diverse people, men, women, different ages, different backgrounds – uh, to try to read it. And then if, you know, if three or four people are telling me the same thing, I think they're probably right. And usually if I think they're probably right, it confirms something that I already knew deep down about the book. Oh, yeah. Like maybe, maybe there's, I, I knew I kind of have to fix this. This wasn't quite working, but I didn't know how to fix it. And then if I hear it from three or four beta readers, this doesn't work then it's just like confirming a deep suspicion. And then I actually get happy because I know I can make the book better. Uh, sometimes I think what hurts most is just indifference when they don't finish the book or just don't offer any feedback You know, because then you can, then you're set to, you can imagine what they might be thinking. Uh-huh. Uh, but in, ge- in general, I try to keep it very professional and figure, you know, for me, the goal is always to make the best book possible and there was really only one major piece of feedback I got on this book that was difficult to change. And that was there was a fairly large uh, secondary story for one of the main characters, Camilla Gray, the main female character in the book. She had a, a kind of a side story that wasn't working for people. I kind of knew it didn't fit into the book that well. So I had to make some significant changes to that. And I was reluctant to do that at first. Uh, it took me a few months of hearing that from a couple people that it wasn't working to make that change. But I know it made the book much, much stronger. And it just emotionally, I was pretty attached to that side story and it just didn't belong in this particular book. So that was a little bit difficult. That was a little bit difficult, but I got over it. And that's the main thing I would say. Try to get multiple opinions. Don't trust, don't change something just because one person yeah. thinks it. Um, yeah. And, but if enough people are telling it to you, they're probably right. Yeah, yeah, most probably. Although it's, uh, you know, it's always difficult to accept, and then you know, <laughs> it's it's not easy. Yeah. But uh, what, what hurt what what hurt especially is you know now that the book is out, and I, I'm very fastidious about you know errors and proofreading, and I you know had I read it multiple times. I had a lot of readers. I had an editor, then a proofreader. And I still got feedback that there's a few typos and things like that. You know, not very many, just a couple. And, you know, most books have a few. Oh, yeah. But that that actually hurt because I really wanted no typos, but it wasn't realistic. Yeah, yeah, I see. Okay, so when you wrote the book and finished your first draft, did you actually put it aside and uh, took some time off to revisit it with fresh eye or no? Yes. Well, I would say after the third draft, I did that. I, I wrote the first draft, which was really you know a bit of a mess. Then I rewrote the whole book over about two months. And then I took a month or two off uh, before looking at it again and got some feedback on it in that month or two. So uh, that was after my second draft. Um, and I, I found that was necessary and I did that multiple times actually that I took, you know, a month off or two months off to come back to it and back to it to see it with the freshest eyes I could. I would never say they were completely free of, uh, the memories of writing it and all that, but, uh, as fresh eyes as I could possibly get. Mm hmm. Yeah, I see. So uh, let's talk about, uh, did you have any, I mean, how did you feel before actually, you know, the the book was launched? Um, Did you have any worries or did you, I mean, did you have any expectations and how these expectations are being realized? Like, you know, what's what's this emotional journey when, when you launch your first book? Yeah, it was tough. You know, I, 
I have a I have a good friend who's published by Knopf, which is you know probably the oldest and most respected uh, U.S. publisher. And I was talking with him in the you know six months before my book came out, when I knew it was coming out. We knew it was going to come out in in July, and. I said, you know, I'm really having a tough time emotionally because I'm worried about it coming out. I don't know if I can finish it in time with the editor. I'm worried about the cover design. And he said, oh, oh it's going to get way, way, way worse <laughs> over the next six months. And because his, his book had come out uh, with a big publisher, big advances, et cetera, uh, much different than mine. And he just said, it's going to get worse. And it did get worse. It got worse and worse emotionally for me. It was really difficult. Uh, I, I had nightmares about the cover design, even though my, my, my cover designer was great. I had, I had dreams where I was getting in fist fights with him over the cover design. Uh, even though nothing like that was really happening, it was just my own neurosis, uh, dreams about, you know, errors that would be in the book. And then there was just the real problems that there was some subtle issues with the book, really subtle character things that I wanted to perfect and in order to perfect them, I had to become a better writer. And you know, I don't think it's perfect by any means. But like, I really wanted to make it as good as possible. It wasn't just, well, let's get this thing out there and see what happens. Um, I was really trying to make it as good as I could. So there was a lot of anxiety about that and a lot of just work about that to try to get it as good as I could before it came out. So yeah, it, I I wouldn't say it was pretty. You know, I I I wasn't writing new stuff which I wanted to be doing at the same time. I wanted to be working on the sequel, and I didn't get much of that done. Uh, and I just had a lot of anxiety about it. And then at the same time, there's there's actually just so much work because I had a I had a big launch team on Facebook that I put together of people who listen to my podcasts and other you know, supporters and long lost people and some media people and to try to help launch the book. So I was just doing tons of work on the marketing and promotion, which for me is not as fulfilling as sitting down and writing new stuff by myself in my room. So, and then planning a big in-person book launch and library things and bookstore things. So it was just like the, the it's like launching a new business. I know you I know you know this because you talk about this on your podcast, but it's like launching a business. Yeah. Uh, and for, and for me, that is much more stressful than say sitting down to write a thousand words, you know, every yeah. morning. So, which were your biggest fears connected to the launch of the book? Um, there's some fear besides of, the cover. <laughs> Yeah, the cover was a big one. Um, there's some fear of uh, – mostly I, I don't really fear the criticism as much because I knew that the book was uh, – I knew that it wasn't going to be amateurish. I knew that it wasn't going to be like uh, – it's not like it was a first draft. It wasn't – I knew that it was close to books in the in the genre that are successful. It was more just the the indifference I think is worse than criticism and that's what most writers get is they get a lot of indifference. It's not that people it's not that people hate your book, it's that most people have never heard of you or never heard of your book. And and so, you know, people are buying my book, they're reading the book, but it's not without having a major uh publisher behind you or already being well known, it's just mostly you do a lot of work and you push it out into this sea of content on the internet and everyone just ignores it. So for me, just knowing that was going to happen, because I know for first-time authors, that's how it is. You know, most first-time authors don't break out and sell, you know, 50,000 copies of their first novel. Uh, it does happen sometimes, but not very much. So just knowing that all the work I was going to do was going to lead mostly to indifference was probably the most difficult thing. Um, and And that really nothing I could do would magically make the book take off. But once I once I accepted that that I'm just gonna I'm gonna put it out and some people will buy it and maybe more will buy the next book hopefully and slowly build a readership, then I felt okay about it. But that was the worst emotional thing. It was just kind of the feeling of God. I'm gonna do all this work, all these events, all these podcasts, all this great stuff that I'm doing that I really enjoy doing, and people just aren't gonna care about the book <laughs> enough to enough to spend three ninety nine on Amazon to buy it. That's, I think, what a lot of people who are producing content of any kind kind of suffer these days just because there's so much stuff out there. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Well, you mentioned something very interesting, and I, I want to go that direction first. Um, you mentioned your podcast and that your podcast listeners were in the launch team and were supporting you with your fiction book. We have similar audiences on the podcast. I mean, our podcasts are for writers. Right. And uh, I was, I, I mean, and I write fiction too. And I never thought that my audience of writers would be like suitable to read female fiction, for example, because in my case, my, you know, most of my listeners are male <laughs> as opposed huh. to, yeah. So that's interesting. So I w I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I have this feeling that maybe not all of your listeners eventually read fiction. They might be nonfiction writers also among them, or, you know, people who don't really kind of, you know, are not really specifically reading that genre. Uh, so how did you end up creating an audience which is so engaged with you that they are inclined to help you out, even if they're not specifically interested in the book itself? Yeah, good question. And I should say, it's not like most of my listeners signed up for my launch team. Really just, you know, probably five or 10 podcast listeners came onto my launch team. And, and you know, hundreds and hundreds of other listeners didn't come onto the launch team. So I, th the main thing I would say was with the launch team, I, I promised a particular thing that I was going to do. The people who listen to my podcast know that, you know, my genre is thriller. And I, I really write my short stories that get published sometimes are really what would be called literary fiction probably. Uh, but I have interest in a lot of different genres and I bring people on my show, mostly fiction authors who write uh, everything, you know, science fiction, romance, uh, thrillers, mysteries, literary fiction, poetry. And I have wide interests in just about everything. And I bring on also publishing experts, marketing people, journalists, people like that. So I think that people who listen to my show know that I have a wide variety of interests, even though I specialize, you know, in my own writing, in in thrillers and in literary fiction. So what I promised with the launch group was just that a, it would be to help me and they would get a free copy of my book and they could read it. And if they felt compelled to write an honest review, they could write one. Um, but also that it would be a place where they would have access to me, where I would try to connect them with people I knew, which I always try to do whenever I can, uh, where I would uh, help them out personally if I could, where we could converse. And the main thing I promised was that I would show them um, what it like what a launch looks like from you know over a six month period. I had the group going for a long time, I think six months total. Uh, from writing the back cover copy to they had input on my cover design. They had input on when I got blurbs from other well-known authors, what blurb to use and how much of it to use. They had input on marketing strategies. So I tried to make it fun and inclusive and educational, even for people who have no interest in thrillers or mysteries. And so I had some people sign up who are – they want to be authors. They're writing, say, science fiction and don't care about thrillers. But they agreed to do it uh, just because they thought they would get some education about when they launch their own book, whether it's self-published or through a traditional publisher of, you know, here's some ways of how to use social media. Here's how to get blurbs from well-known authors that you may not already be connected to. So I just tried to make it useful to them as much as possible and then most of them ended up reading the book and writing honest reviews and uh, some of them didn't and they just participated and got what they needed out of it. And overall, it was a great experience. You know, it's not enough to make a book a success, but it was it was a good start. And I did connect with some podcast listeners on a much deeper level, which was a lot of fun, too. OK, I see. So let's talk about your podcast. Um I mean, usually um, people kind of, you know, have this big why behind such big projects like podcast, you know, writing a novel and stuff like that. So which was your big why of deciding to launch a podcast for writers? Well, I went to my first writing conference in 2012, the Pacific Northwest Writers Association Conference. So this is a big four-day event in a hotel with about 500 writers, maybe 20 literary agents, marketing experts, 
publishing people, uh, people from you know Amazon, uh, everyone you know, big players in the publishing world. And it was so ama- it was so amazing for me because I had always felt kind of like an outsider in the publishing world. And when you're just in a hotel for four days with everyone from brand new authors to famous best selling authors to agents you get a view of the publishing world that's very different than when you're on the outside of it. And I just felt this was amazing. For me, that experience really changed my life. And I felt like, wow, this is a world I want to be in. I want to be you know, an author. I want to be teaching at this conference uh, a few years from now. I want to be really in this world. And so I wanted more of that. I wanted to really educate myself about the publishing world and become an expert in it. And so that was that was one of the big reasons why I went down the path of the podcast is that having a podcast would give me uh, a way to uh, get to know all these interesting people. I also have a, you know, because of my journalism background, doing interviews and things like that was a natural fit for me. And so that made sense. But I wanted to really educate myself and at the same time, provide a service to people who don't have the money, say, or don't live in the right place to go to this kind of writing conference. I wanted to make it like a big, awesome international writing conference uh, for free on the internet. And so with that in mind, I decided I'm going to get, you know, self-published authors. I'm going to get big best-selling authors who have 20 books and make a lot of money. I'm going to get literary agents. I'm going to get journalists. I'm going to get people from Amazon and bring them all together on the podcast to make it like a really cool writing conference that you can just listen to an hour at a time. That was what I wanted to do both for my own benefit and the benefit of people out there who can't get out to a conference. So that was the big why for me. And it's, it's been that, and it's been a lot more, you know, I think connecting with, with uh, well-known authors in my genre has been a great side benefit of it, but mostly just, just learning from, from, really successful people has been a huge benefit that I never expected it to be as good as it's been in that regard. Okay, I see. Well, basically, you know, it's a great podcast and there is a lot to learn and uh, loads of uh, valuable content. And, you know, I do agree that it's really nice for writers to have such references to refer to and listen to for free because it's kind of, you know, uh, not all courses, even quite expensive ones, are really, you know, as valuable as some podcasts are. So I guess it's kind of, you know, you can always find new resources which are worth the basically the time you will be spending listening to those. Yeah, I agree. And, and one thing I found especially interesting about it is that really successful writers who've written, say, 20 books or 50 books um, and have had long careers, they really have a tremendous amount to teach teach us about writing. And they're they're willing to, to come on small podcasts or newer podcasts and share that information for free. Um, and there's really nothing better than that, as far as I can tell, about learning how to write is – talking to experts uh, who you admire about how to write. And I've just gotten so much great advice and input from writers from all different genres that I can't think of a better a better uh, education for myself. And I'm glad that some, some listeners are agreeing. Okay, that leads me to kind of, you know, one of the last questions in that case. Uh, let's get the advice from you. For newbie writers, what is your biggest advice? Hmm. I would say the first thing is don't just write. Try to write every day, but don't just write. Do something else also. Uh, whether most people will have jobs or families, for example. And I think that the the stuff of writing has to come out of the stuff of life, of interactions, relationships, jobs, disappointments, you know, loves, passions, etc. So I always get sad when I meet people who haven't aren't living very full lives and are just writing because sometimes I think that the writing can be become very self-referential and and kind of only interesting to that writer. So I would say live as much as you possibly can and try to get a serious writing routine down, you know, where you're where you're trying to agree with yourself to write you know, whatever it is for you, 500 words a day or 5,000 words per week 
or whatever it is. Uh, it's different for different people based on their lives. But to, uh, to get a serious writing routine down in the midst of your busy life so that you uh, – so that it just becomes part of your life and I think that's the best way to get better. And for me, journalism did a lot of that, just getting used to writing and editing constantly. Um, but if, if you don't have a journalism uh, job, then doing it on your own, you know, 500 words a day or whatever it is, I think is the best way to get going. But not to do that instead of living. That's the main thing. Yeah, very, very good advice. Thank you. Okay. And the last thing before we part, where can my listeners find you? Uh, you know, where should they go to listen to your podcast, to get your book and to find out more about you? Yeah, so the podcast uh, is on iTunes and on Stitcher, and I think it's on TuneIn Radio, too. I don't know if anyone goes to there anymore, but <laughs> it's the R Writer 2.0 podcast, so 2.0, Writer 2.0 podcast. Uh, iTunes is the best place, but it's also every episode is available on my website, which is www.acfuller.com. You can find all, uh, all the episodes there or a link to subscribe. Uh, my book, The Anonymous Source, is available all the major platforms, Amazon, uh, iTunes, Barnes & Noble. I think my publisher just put it on sale. This is uh, – we're recording this uh, early September. It's going to be on on sale until early October. So I think it's only $3.99 on Amazon right now for the ebook. Uh, so you can find that on Amazon and you can link to that uh, from my, my website, mm -hmm. all, all the different places to find it. And I'm on Twitter too, at AC Fuller Author. Okay, great, great. Well, thank you very much for coming over. I truly enjoyed our interview. And, you know, I encourage our listeners, my listeners to go and check your podcast out. And maybe it will be, I mean, I think it's worth to be, uh, you know, in there to listen to lists. <laughs> Yes, I, I agree. And uh, I always tell people to go find your podcast whenever I can, whenever I know they're fans of mine. So we have we, we have a lot of crossover, I think, between yeah. our different shows, but in a, in a good way. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, I truly believe that even if, you know, there are podcasts who have the same guests, usually they end up with different interviews. So it's, you know, <laughs> it's not yes. like they will listen to the same thing twice. It's definitely true. And I know, that, you know, since you focus a little more on nonfiction and I have probably 80 percent fiction authors on on my podcast, you know, slightly different angles that we take. So oh, yeah. uh, the more the merrier as far as I could tell. Well, I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks so much. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you. All right. We'll talk again, I hope. Yeah. Well, it seems like that was it for today. If you have already written a book, please make sure you check out our services at www.publishmybook.today. And if you haven't yet written a book, please make sure you check out my free guide, which will help you get over the mental blocks to publishing your first book and where you can find out the five steps to build your writing confidence. And that is at www.annealexander.com. Dot com backward slash mindset. Meanwhile, stay inspired and motivated and keep writing.